to be convivial obviously is to to live with but not just to live but to sort of thrive um in this kind of graceful playfulness and the idea that social interaction you know doesn't have to be simply um you know the mediated relation of people as things in terms of exchange and use but rather a kind of beautiful game if you like all right what's up everybody i am justin murphy this is the other life podcast and today i am joined by nina power a good friend of mine who's been on the podcast a couple times now some of you might remember her she is a british philosopher and writer she was a academic for many years recently left academia kind of like i did you know in her own way and now she's just a writer speaker and kind of itinerant uh, philosopher who does things on the internet but she also has a book coming out soon with penguin so uh, it's called what men want so you can pre-order that now i'll put a link in the show notes but she's joining me here today in primarily to talk about a new course that we're launching as you many of you know i've been doing courses and people love them they work really well in all ways that i can see so i've decided to really double down on that we're going to be doing more and more courses and i think in my own little way i'm building the seed of something that might very well you know in five years ten years we might look back on it as maybe fundamentally revolutionizing the world of liberal arts education i think i think i'm i'm kind of possibly i don't want to overhype things you know because you never know where things are going but it's working and people really like it and it makes a good chunk of change for me and my operations so i think there's a lot of you know longevity here i think we are reinventing what the liberal arts are for the internet age i feel like that is what i've kind of come across and what it's an opportunity in front of me so i'm doubling down and i, I want to keep building it out keep doing more courses and build this course catalog that is kind of the preeminent course catalog for people who want to tackle serious issues and, and themes and figures in, in the history of philosophy. And next, I think we'll go into social science. And yeah, so anyway, I don't want to get too uh, pie in the sky here, but I'm excited. And so the next podcast, the next, this podcast is going to be about our next course, which is going to be on Ivan Illich. Ivan Illich, very interesting dude. He was a Catholic priest, but uh, also a prolific writer. And he didn't write in a, a priestly kind of way. He was very interested in uh, social and political issues, especially around technology. And so Nina is going to be teaching a course coming in the middle of July on Ivan Illich. It'll be an intensive eight-week seminar, and she's going to cover the entire body of work of Ivan Illich, or at least I should say, you know, the key ideas that run throughout the entire body of work of Ivan Illich. And so members who join the course will be reading uh, books that represent all of his key ideas, basically. So in this podcast, we try to give you a, a tour de force, basically. We try to give you the highlight reel in advance of the key ideas uh, across the syllabus that she's designed. And so this is a masterclass on Ivan Illich all in one sitting. We talk about Ivan Illich's ideas on gender, on technology, on the importance of silence, on how economic growth causes psychological problems, on the importance of de-schooling and there's just so much in this podcast that is super relevant to contemporary themes it's actually kind of uncanny how this guy writing mostly in the 70s was kind of his heyday he wrote throughout his life but that's that's kind of the decade roughly to pin him to he basically diagnosed about four things which are now today incredibly salient and which not many people in the 70s were thinking about so just to give you a few examples of the things we talk about today in his thought. One is the deleterious effects of information society on our psychology, on our on our social being, the way that information glut is uh, basically destroying our brains. We talk about gender and sex and what Ivan Illich calls the the disappearance of gender or the decline of gender. He's basically diagnosing the late stage. Uh, I'm sorry. He's diagnosing at an early stage what we are today living through the late stages of, which is this kind of eradication of gender differences and this kind of myth that, you know, ev you know anyone can be any gender that they want. And uh, he basically diagnoses the some of the ramifications of that way of thinking before it was even as salient as it is now. So it's really pretty uncanny in, in his uh, prescience. We also talk about things like urbanism and just the design of cities and uh, how he diagnosed the extraordinary negative effects of just modern, you know, capitalist metropolitan life. And we even talk about things like Bitcoin and technology and the possibility that contemporary technological trends may or may not 
create openings for more humanistic visions and more humanistic ways of organizing society and different communities and stuff like that. So yeah, this is um, very fascinating. Uh, it's an absolute masterclass in the key ideas of, of Ivan Illich. And specifically, there's a lot in there today in this podcast about how it connects up and sheds light on contemporary issues that are very salient, even COVID, right? Even the norm today or this kind of dominant Western submission to lockdowns and extreme you know, medicalization. Uh, he has a book called Medical Nemesis, and it's all about the ways in which, you know, uh, kind of over-medicalizing society was something that he saw coming in its early stages, and he, and he provides a really interesting diagnosis of that. And it's all very interesting because it's from a Catholic perspective, but he's also a leftist. So this is another reason why I wanted to really focus on Ivan Illich for a little while and get him on the podcast, do a course on him, because he represents basically a kind of cultural conservatism that is combined with a kind of radical economic leftism. And I think that's just a, a very neglected space or subspace in the in the you know ideological matrix. So yeah, he's a brilliant guy. Nina is a brilliant person. And I love this podcast. I think you'll get a lot out of it if you're interested in these themes. So, and of course, if you're interested in doing the full course, just go to illichcourse.com. You can download the syllabus and it'll give you a nice sequence of readings for you to cover all of these themes on your own. Like maybe you don't need a full course. That's totally fine. Then just go and grab the syllabus and you can do all the readings and, and study at your own pace. Of course, if you decide that you want to join the course later, you're more than welcome to. But even if you just want to get updates in the future and you want to learn more about the course when we open enrollment, uh, if you're just curious, Go and sign up, download the syllabus, and just get on the email list at illichcourse.com. That's I-L-L-I-C-H course.com. All right. That's all we got today, folks. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. As always, over and out. On to the show. All right. So this course on Ivan Illich is going to cover the whole range of his thought, pretty much all of his big ideas, ranging from de-schooling society to his ideas about economic growth and energy the problems of technology, even his thoughts on gender and modern medicine. So what we're going to do for this podcast is we are just going to go through all of the highlights, basically one at a time. Nina's designed this excellent syllabus uh, that she thinks represents a, you know, attractive logical sequence for working through his body of work. So we're just going to give you a kind of tour de force. We're just going to give you the highlight reel, basically. And, and Nina will explain in each week what is really most interesting to her about that week and and what's really at stake. So in the very first week, she has us read the Celebration of Awareness book, A Call for Institutional Revolution. So Nina, I would love if you could just kind of tell us in a nutshell, what's, what's the big theme there and why did you choose to start the course with this book? Okay, so this is the book or one edition of it there. Um, well, yeah, I'd just like to say one of the, the very useful things about Illich is the way he writes these very uh, short, very clear books. And even when they're collections of essays, they're kind of even more straightforward in many ways. So one of the things about the course that's uh, permitted, I suppose, is a kind of chronological explanation of all of the different aspects of Illich's life and work and thought. Um, because obviously he was involved in kind of practical programs as well in Latin America and America. And, you know, he's constantly thinking about the world he's in, in a very kind of embedded way. And so basically we just begin with some of his essays from the late sixties before then moving on to the kind of, uh, more well-known ideas, um, and so on. So, but right from the start, so in this book, you know, a call for institutional revolution, you can see from the subtitle that he's thinking about institutions and the way in which they've become ossified, the way in which they often um, act as in, in opposition, let's say, to their founding principles. And the institutions are a kind of problem. They're a huge, huge problem for modernity. Um, and he, in these various essays, he talks about um, violence and charity and the church and obviously throughout his career he's in kind of dialogue sometimes opposition very serious opposition with the catholic church um, but always trying to think about how to um, integrate a thinking of religion and jesus into his teachings so at the same time he's both a kind of political and a theological thinker we could say yeah. So an interesting question, actually, which maybe I should have begun with is just I'm curious, how did you first get interested in Ivan Illich? What was the story there? 
Yeah, so I guess I came across a copy of um, Deschooling Society, which is, you know, his probably his most well-known book in some ways, um, maybe about 15, 20 years ago, I suppose, just somewhere I was staying actually had a copy and I thought this sounded like an interesting idea. And actually, I became very fascinated by concepts of pedagogy and thinkers like Ronciere, who also talk about kind of ignorance and how to teach and how to think about learning uh, without um, uh, usual forms of um, hierarchy and authority and so on. And obviously, going all the way back to Plato, you have um, questions of what pedagogy is, you know, this idea of leading the child and whether uh, schooling is more about kind of uh, rote learning and instruction and in fact ideological conformity and trying to adapt people for the societies in which they horribly find themselves um, and preparing them for some of the worst iniquities of existence in the form of badly paid work and the segregation of daily life and the sort of elimination of joy and so on. And I suppose there's something kind of fascinating about um, Illich's idea about in a way, unlearning all of these institutional forms. And it's not just the content of education, it's the form of education. And I think in recent years, um, in other thinkers like uh, Malcolm Harris and Freddie de Boer, you have also a kind of, um, you know, Illichian to some extent kind of critique of like the American school system. And I think even in the last year, this is why de-schooling might be a fantastic book Um, you know, in context, there's been a lot of um, suspicion, I suppose, about going back to the existing school system on the part of a lot of parents, like the pandemic and the lockdown has allowed them, I think, to understand the limitations of education as it's currently um, practiced um, in institutions. And so I think we probably already have seen a massive uptick in various Western countries towards kind of homeschooling and away from the kind of centralised idea oh, of, definitely. of the school. Yeah. Yeah. There's a bunch of startups right now that are really trying to tackle this homeschooling uh, phenomenon. Uh, so you're seeing more and more people put their kids in what are they're calling uh, kind of pods where they hire a private teacher um, that they like basically. And then they mm. chip in on the cost of hiring that teacher. And it's actually quite affordable to um, give your kids basically like private homeschooling in a group of other kids with, you know, parents and kids who, who you, your family identifies with. And uh, people are doing that a lot now. And there's a lot of startups now emerging that are trying to scale this up. So I think you're absolutely right to sense that this is uh, a really hot phenomenon that will only continue to to grow. And it's one of the reasons why we wanted to do this course on Ivan Illich, because he just seems so of of the moment in this regard. So I would love to hear, Nina, if you could help the audience kind of understand what is Illich's, what's the key idea behind his critique of institutions? Like what is his theory of institutions? What exactly about institutions goes wrong that, that he kind of uniquely figures out or, or zooms in on? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I was just looking at this gigantic book that's just very recently come out on Illich, which is by David Cayley, who's basically, you know, probably his best reader and certainly his, his best, um, um, I don't know, the most uh, empathetic uh, thinker and friend of Illich. And Cayley makes the point repeatedly that one of the things that Illich is arguing about institutions is their historical emergence from the church, if you see what I mean. So rather than making a separation, as many people do, between a kind of uh, Christian and then a post-Christian society and the idea of the institution as something kind of merely bureaucratic or technocratic, um, that Illich is in fact trying to trace the long history of the institution. I mean, he's not the only one doing this, of course. But one of the problems with institutions is their their sort of inhumanism, the the fact that bureaucracy and technocracy ultimately come to kind of undermine all of the sort of uh, human elements that we might want to see in something, particularly in something like education or creativity or thought or um, being together. Com- you know, the idea of conviviality is crucial for Illich, and so. I think we're maybe we're always in a crisis of institutions, but I think particularly um, at this moment, there's a there's a huge collapse. I mean, we're we're both part of, let's say, uh, moving away from the higher education, the university system and trying to do something new. I mean, partly because we both believe in ideas and their importance and the, you know, the reality and meaning of a kind of community. Um, So And those sorts of things seem to be kind of uh, disappearing at a vast rate of knots, Um, not to mention the the 
you know, the horrific cost and the debt and the anxiety involved in a lot of these educational um, institutions. So, I mean, it's not just education. In a way, everything is a kind of institution for Illich. And it's it's where um, institutions start to become like tools, which is to say things that diminish and take us away from our capacity. And it's not that we can ever really eliminate tools. We're, we're fundamentally tool beings, to use a Heideggerian expression, you know, we are um, technological um, creatures. Um, but there has to be a kind of, uh, you know, almost like a human limit uh, to the extent that these things, um, you know, destroy us and we become the tool of the tool or the, the cog in the machine uh, and so on. Right. Okay. Okay. Excellent. And could you tell us a little bit about what is the eloquence of silence? So it's actually about a uh, practice of listening apart from anything else so it's he, this is in when he's talking to uh you have a mass influx of puerto ricans to the catholic church in new york and there's a lot of kind of uh, unsettled feeling um you know and he's trying to encourage a kind of integrated acceptance of different groups basically so it's a kind of um <sighs> A sort of methodology if you like a kind of social methodology I suppose um, and but he kind of links it to prayer and a kind of meditative uh, response to the world and so I mean you know we've, we are we do live in a world that's filled with absolute um, chatter and you know the overproduction of speech of which we are also involved um, but at the same time that you know there has to be this kind of emphasis on on listening and 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 silence and yeah i suppose um it's it's ultimately a religious kind of silence i suppose but he's trying to sort of use it in a practical invoke it in a practical sense okay so in week two we move on to this idea of de-schooling society i feel like my impression is that this is probably one of the ideas he's best known for maybe um, so yeah. i wonder if you could just kind of give us the high level overview of you know what what is what's going on there in this in this in this idea of de-schooling society? What would it look like to de-school society, and what is he? Uh, what's what's he really throwing down there? Um, sure, absolutely. And now uh, I think we've I've already mentioned kind of de this book already, and why I became interested in Illich. It was just the first book I came across, probably a similar experience for most people. Um, I think one thing to be um, clear about is that Illich is not sort of uh, rushing to simply abolish or destroy existing institutions. And I think this is an important discussion to have in the light of um, various conversations about abolition and destruction and what happens when we, let's say, too quickly um, call for the abandonment of particular structures. So there's a book that follows this in which he answers some of the criticisms and he makes it very um, clear that he's uh, more interested in kind of disestablishing and dismantling, but in the name of something different. So it has there has to be a kind of positive reconstruction of let's say uh, learning networks would be one thing that he's interested in um and you know it's it's interesting uh, learning webs learning networks that that the in a way the internet he kind of has this prefigurative image of what the internet could provide which is it basically about the desire to learn so let's say you want to learn a particular skill and there's someone who's willing to teach you and you know this kind of uh, idea so rather than the the curriculum and the kind of top down sort of um uh, system uh, which is very very divided and non holistic in any case you know like the segregation of subjects into particular blocks is a kind of crucial uh, way that knowledge is institutionalized, compartmentalized and atomized and so on. And um, so, yeah, so so there's a kind of positive dimension to this, too. I would really like to, to, to stress. I think one of the kind of main arguments in this book is, I mean, you know, as maybe we've all had an experience is is actually school is a kind of oftentimes a holding pen and there's a lot of wasted time and you know the amount of learning that actually gets done in schools is very minimal and for a lot of people like no matter who you are or where you go to school I think and it's it, prison I hated yeah. school my entire life <laughs> I hated it <laughs> I I was more ambivalent but I it, I, it took me until 16 to even enjoy anything about it. The rest of the time I was just reading novels. I just right. went to like my local comprehensive. I was not engaged at all in anything that was, you know, being 
being said somehow. And I think that's a really right. not unusual um, My experience. entire K through 12 education, every morning when I would wake up on a weekday and had to go to school, I would think, I would like stare out the window waiting for my school bus to arrive. And I would just think to myself like, how is the, how does our society work like this? How, how is this the case that every morning I have to go into this prison and this is like legal? Like how I, I was always, and I was always kind of like morbid every single morning, K through 12, my entire like education. I hated it. So this resonates with me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so basically it's a, it's part of his um, critique of institutions of bureaucracy and also kind of the way in which, yeah, schools map on, it's a quite Foucauldian point, actually, you know, is it any wonder that schools resemble hospitals, resemble, you know, asylums, resemble prisons? It's, yeah, like you say, they're, they're right. very, very similar. Um, and so it's also about the way in which um, people are being made into commodities through schooling. So not only sort of things being treated as things, but also as things that are produced by the institution so for particular economies and obviously like there's we know that's true right it's not it's not a kind of um uh you know unusual argument i mean i think one of the main criticisms he makes though is of a narrative of progress you know and i think there's been a lot of interesting anti-enlightenment or post-liberal thought lately and i'm teaching a course on post-liberalism to adults at the moment uh, like an adult ed course and, you know, this kind of, um, and, and I put Illich on the course towards the end briefly, but a kind of deep frustration, I think, or a, a recognition that these narratives um, of, you know, ever expanding production and consumption and enjoyment and, um, you know, and progress are, I mean, we're always perhaps wrong <laughs> in a way. And that, that, that we're kind of... Uh, you know, the, you can see in like something like the PMC, if we accept that term, um, Catherine Liu's book is, is polemic, is quite interesting on this point, that you have at the moment, like in America and other, other Western countries, other countries, like a overproduction of graduates and a kind of expectation that's been given to a particular class of people and a class that's bolstered by a particular culture and a set of ideological values. Um but the generation of expe expectation is is undercut by the reality of what is available, both in terms of employment and in terms of what you can actually do. Um, and so I think he's very good at kind of recognizing that. And we, so I basically I would update Illich on this de-schooling de point. Like he, he, you know, the thread is there basically. Okay, interesting, interesting, awesome. And so. Maybe we'll move on down to week three. In week three, you talk about tools for conviviality. I think this is also a somewhat well-known phrase, at least for people who have you know heard of Ivan Illich. How about you give us the give us the give us the high-level overview of kind of what's most interesting or or relevant to you here? Yeah, absolutely. So I kind of already mentioned. Um, Illich's uh, sort of uh, concern about tools and concern about technology overall and, and in many ways he's a kind of theorist or a sociologist or a thinker of of tools and our particular relation to them and that the kind of increasing way in which they come to dominate us and um, one of the things that Illich does really well is to try to very beautifully resurrect particular um, concepts or particular terms and so one of his um, words in this the sense is um, this uh, word um, uh, eutropelia, which is E-U-T-R-A-P-E-L-I-A, -E which he translates as um, graceful playfulness, which he thinks we need to bring back into our personal um, relationships. Um, and it's quite a, you know, a, an ancient term in a way. So to be convivial obviously is to, to live with but not just to live, but to sort of thrive um, in this kind of graceful playfulness. And the idea that social interaction, you know, doesn't have to be simply, um, you know, the mediated relation of people as things in terms of exchange and use, but rather a kind of beautiful game, if you like. And yeah, um, similarly, he, yeah, exactly. And so he kind of uses conviviality against 
um, the expansion of technology, basically. He wants to limit tools so that they serve this, um, this term of eutropelia. Um, and also austerity, which he tries to, to resurrect this word austerity, which is even more interesting to do so now because obviously austerity became then a sort of economic term that was used to basically punish countries like Britain after the economic crash. And, you know, it, it doesn't have very nice associations. Um, but actually for, for Illich, it, he takes it from Aquinas and he talks about it as the, being the foundation of friendship, in fact. And so austerity then is basically like, um, yeah, this kind of, um, of, you know, I'll, I'll just read this, you know, austerity is a virtue which does not exclude all enjoyment, but only those which are distracting from or destructive of personal relatedness. So it's basically allowing the space for particular kinds of beautiful or graceful relationality by limiting distraction. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of this kind of, yeah, language and terminology. Yeah, it's it's interesting because a lot of the stuff I've been reading most lately and a lot of the stuff I talk about lately is uh, definitely very much in the in the more accelerationist side of things. And so it's very interesting in a way to be introducing Illich, especially to, to, the, to the course catalog, because it's very not that right. It's very, um, you know, he, he does seem, you know, pretty bullish on the possibility of humans kind of reorganizing things in such a way as to as to kind of stop the the mega machine is that is that a fair interpretation or um yeah i think so and i i mean i think even if there there's something perhaps doomed about this project i think it's absolutely i mean i don't think there's there's something doomed but i'm increasingly interested in like questions of degrowth and deceleration and i've always been critical of left accelerationism um and accelerationism in general for that matter you know in terms of the kind of acceptance of a certain kind of technological determinism or kind of promethean um, dimension to human um, expression um so i kind of want to use illich to provide a kind of counterpoint but i framed this week in particular around those, these discussions about accelerationism i believe so there's a sense in which we're, we're going to use illich to directly look at you know, these contem contemporary framings of technology. Excellent. So, yeah, I think it would be good to kind of double click on this for the mo for a moment, because I'm curious how you see this, how, how you think this shakes out. Like, do you do you did did Illich believe that his ideas were were, were, were practical or, or was it more of a kind of, you know, tragic philosophical mode where it's like, I'm going to say what we should be doing. I'm going to say what life should be even if there's a kind of inner self-consciousness that it's probably doomed, like where did he fall on this, on the spectrum of like actual practical, you know, uh, uh, implementation optimism versus the, the, the more kind of like tragic mode where thinkers like this sometimes dwell. Yeah. I think again, David, David Cayley is very, very good on this. And I think it's, um, a kind of curious paradoxical mixture of, of the two, uh, I suppose it's, there's some some essays and so on where it, he seems kind of very um, um, optimistic and that we can reorganize things socially and otherwise, you know, and of course, he's always proposing positive alternatives like the learning networks as opposed to the school. And, you know, that there are a lot of, um, yeah, the things that Illich is kind of trying to do is in a way to follow Christ, you know, that Illich is actually... Uh, really trying to emulate um, a, a, a you know uh, a love of Christ and to become more like Christ and this is the way that Illich does it so even though there's a kind of apocalypticism <laughs> in Illich it's Illich notes that this is the apocalypticism of industrial modern society itself that has kind of tried to in a way it, that has immanentized these Christian concepts um but wow. but yeah so are, are you becoming a tradcath nina <laughs> no more like a sort of um i don't know like a centrist anglican i think oh, okay interesting i i can't be because properly have, trad yeah. <laughs> are, are you are you sincerely becoming anglican or are you just kind of joking no i i uh because you you haven't always been right no, I mean I'm I'm the you know just another bastard product of this you know degenerate liberal 
he- hedonistic age. <laughs> but <laughs> but no, I think the... yeah. I Go I've ahead. been I've been reading a lot of Alistair McIntyre and yeah. I mean, thinking about the very complex and Illich, obviously, and, and thinking about the very complex relationship, I suppose, between, you know, modernity, pre-modernity, um, you know, the end of liberalism, if if that's indeed how we choose to see things and what we might want to preserve and what we might not want to preserve and, and how to rethink questions of tradition itself, but also, um, you know, questions of community and belonging and these kinds of things, which are obviously eroded by liberal capitalism so and god I might love it. god, this god is might, be tra- a, by, might be part of that and uh, no, no, undoubtedly you're tra- you're transitioning from your your neo-paganism to proper catholic traditionalism this is very good i approve of this <laughs> i'm basically <laughs> just recapitulating the end of the roman empire <laughs> aren't we all <laughs> okay great so uh week four is all about energy and equity um, yeah, yes. This this other other book of his. And you know, he has this very interesting theory that it's it's kind of like a functional it's kind of a functional theory. It's a somewhat kind of empirical theory about kind of the relationship between energy and social re- relationships. Could you break that down a little bit for us? Yeah, so actually, I mean, I already again sort of um started talking about the relation to accelerationism and we see the question of technology in a way, of course, becomes the question of well how does this stuff run how does it work and i'd just like to point out there's a very interesting section here called the ineffectiveness of acceleration so illich very very explicitly and this is you know 1974 this is first published um you know already talking about words that then became much more popular later on as we all know um and yeah, he, he talks a lot about the energy crisis as it was seen in the in the 70s. And again, it's very interesting to think about that today in relation to, I mean, only yesterday, uh, Elon Musk, uh, for, for whatever set of reasons, maybe cynically, um, decided to, to abandon Bitcoin uh, because of its uh, uh, economic cost, its energetic costs um, and, you know, potential um, uh, sort of environmental destruction. I mean, whether that's... That's true or not? Uh, it's an open question. I mean, whether Elon Musk is doing it for that reason, I suppose it's an open question. Um, but also the question of like the pipeline, for example, in America, you know, that the hackers, uh, you know, like um, hacking the pipeline and, and, you know, it seems like forcing a kind of ransom payment. Um, but, you know, the question of energy, people used to talk about peak oil. Clearly, we're in a we're always in a kind of energy crisis of one kind or another. The transition to either nuclear or to um, uh, environmentally friendly uh, energy supply systems. Uh, we're still in the midst of those uh, questions, um, not to mention the kind of, um, you know, ecological crisis as such, you know, however we want to conceive of that. So I think. You know, some of what Illich is talking about is maybe more metaphorical, like about speed and slowness. But at the same time, there is um, a real purpose to this, um, the way we think about how we live in terms of how fast we want to do things and whether speed is in itself something to be venerated. You know, I mean, everything gets faster all the time. Right. But is that a good. Right. So he's he's broadly in this kind of degrowth camp. Right. Wants to, I, I, wants to slow down society. Yeah, I mean, I think degrowth is a lot of aspects, and I think this is the one one of the things we'll discuss is 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 Illich in the context of contemporary debates, right? But I think it's yeah. I mean, I would put, definitely put him in that kind of trajectory, um, you know, and and even questions about how we travel. I mean, this is largely about how we travel. You know, the the shift, let's say, from a kind of pedestrian to a, a cycling to a kind of um, vehicular um life is you know a very uh rapid one you know like we're talking about just over 100 years for those things to shift right so uh, even this also has a lot of resonance right now because it's easy to say like oh yeah you know technological acceleration everything's speeding up this is impossible you're never going to get this kind of philosophy implemented but Interestingly, you are seeing more and more people with this kind of attitude, and I think you are seeing more people experiment with different types of private communities and different types of housing projects and things like that, which I, it seems to me, it feels to me that these things are reaching a new a new kind of inflection point where um, you're going to see people building, you know, 
private cities with, let's say, with no car traffic, right? There's a lot of, if you look at like, um, if you look at the crypto world, actually, a lot of the, the, the recently wealthy kind of Bitcoin people are really interested in urbanism. You'd be surprised. And there's actually a kind of um, somewhat visible niche within the Bitcoin world where people are talking about, you know, building cities that have the same kind of long term permanent value that Bitcoin has. So the idea is that actually like a lot of modern architecture and modern urbanism is this cheap, flimsy, um, overly instrumental uh, kind of short term calculations underwrite all of, you know, the architecture and design decisions that go into contemporary uh, metropolitan centers. And the idea is that if you have really, really hard money uh, like Bitcoin that basically overthrows the fiat standard, then you'll have people that are investing more and more in actually ideal arrangements that last for the long term. So people can start to think like, what would a city look like if we really wanted to live in it forever? You know, and uh, so that's just kind of an, that's one vector of, of interesting uh, kind of uh, viewpoints on on this question. But if, if you also look at other people like, you know, Wrath of Non and all these different people who on, on the Internet are really kind of uh, uh, showing that people are super, super interested in in yeah better better lifestyle design all the way up to redesigning cities uh, i think there's it's very possible that in the next five to 20 years you actually do see a lot of successful experiments and basically making little mini cities that for instance don't have cars or have all of this stuff optimized in a way more humanistic way i think this is actually very very live wire right now yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, I, one of the things that comes to mind as you speak, I suppose, is a kind of possibility also to reevaluate um, beauty, you know, and what does it mean to build something that is designed to last for a very long time as opposed to something that's, you know, when when people built cathedrals and so on, these are built for the greater glory of God, right, to last for as long as you possibly can imagine. So, and that's something that obviously disappears with the advent of modern architecture in many ways is the you know, the any higher purpose for the um, design or architecture. So I'd, I'd be fascinated to see how this intersects with the question of beauty and aesthetics more generally in these future cities. I mean, I think, you know, just on what you're saying, there's a kind of interesting quote here, just briefly, it says, a low energy policy allows for a wide choice of lifestyles and cultures. If, on the other hand, a society opts for high energy consumption, its social relations must be dictated by technocracy and will be equally distasteful, whether labeled capitalist or socialist. You know, so there's something fascinating about that, you know, that a low energy society actually allows for, let's say, a patchwork um, set of different types of approaches to how to, to live, which kind of relates, I think, very much to what you're saying about these proposals or these ideas. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think in a weird way, technological acceleration might be producing interesting opportunities for, you know, paradoxically enough, carving out these uh, spaces of humanism, possibly that that I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not convinced that that's not, you know, I think people like Nick Land would probably laugh at that. But I, I think that's not uh, it's it's not a foregone conclusion. It's It's quite it's quite conceivable or plausible to me. Yeah, no, I agree. I know certainly I think this is the, these antagonisms are precisely what we should be discussing in any case. So, right. Excellent. Excellent. And so in week six, you move on to gender. And this is kind of interesting uh, for me to see because I, I actually had no idea that Illich ever really wrote about gender. I'm certainly no Ill, Ill, Illich scholar myself. And so um, he has said some interesting things. I, I would love to unpack this a little bit. So uh, one quote here is that he says, as the ascetic and the poet meditate on death and thus gratefully enjoyed the exquisite aliveness of the present. So we must face the sad loss of gender. I strongly suspect that a contemporary art of living can be recovered so long as our austere and clear sighted acceptance of the double ghetto of economic neuters then moves us to renounce the comforts of economic sex. What is he referring to when he says the sad loss of gender and what does mm -hmm. he mean by economic sex? Yeah. So, I mean, this was a very uh, controversial book. It got very slammed by a lot of feminists at the time and, and um, kind of contributed to like a, it's a big downturn, I would say, in Illich's reception. Um, 
but I think there's a lot here to um, to kind of um, resurrect. And and so his argument really about gender prior to what he calls the neuter, like the kind of economic neuter, is to say that there was segregation in terms of sex and in terms of the roles that men and women had in um, in society, and that this was in a way. Um, in, not necessarily good or bad. And I think this is one of the problems that um, anybody has about talking about sexual difference today is that there's an automatic assumption that if you even invoke sexual difference, then you must be saying that one sex is better than the other or that, you know, that, that if we go back to thinking about pre-modern um, types of sexual roles, that somehow we must be celebrating uh, reactionary or traditionalist uh, understandings of men and women and that you know, if you're a man or a woman, you should be doing certain kinds of things. And I don't think Illich is doing that. Um, you know, he kind of starts by asking, like, why are um, uh, women sort of, why have women historically been kind of economically inferior to men and um, tries to sort of be incredibly sympathetic? Like, in a way, this is his response to a lot of the feminist um, movement. You know, and this is in 1982, this book um, comes out. And so he's trying to kind of um, respond to a lot of the feminist points about the unpaid labour, so shadow work or house housework, um, you know, the, the increasing politicisation of things like childcare and so on in advanced industrial or industrial societies, we would say, which happens at the late 60s, mostly in the 70s in Western countries. Um, you know, there becomes a kind of, uh, you know, obviously political discussion about that and we have the rise of second wave feminism broadly speaking around this time so he, it's his response to this and the way he tries to do it is to trace back this idea of gender and whether he's, he's using the right word there or a word we would accept because obviously gender came to mean several different things in the decades after he's using it but we could say um loosely speaking that what he means is perhaps what we might call sexual difference today in certain ways, which is to say that there is a difference between men and women and that this plays out socially, or at least it in a kind of uh, pre-modern uh, period. Um, because it's definitely the case if we think about um, capitalism and we think about employment under capitalism, that people are more or less treated, particularly in advanced technological uh, language-based knowledge economies, as more or less interchangeable, like it doesn't particularly matter if you're a man or a woman, if you're doing a data entry job, it doesn't matter to your employer. It might matter in certain contexts, um, but it doesn't in general. Like the, there is a kind of neutering of sex in the workplace, which is to say you are simply uh, an employee, right? And you work and you sell your labor power and, and so on. And so men and women in a way have become uh, much more similar in certain ways. Certainly as liberal subjects, we would also say that there's a kind of uh, indetermination in many uh, respects, whether it's to do with dating or consumption or whatever, you know, that the difference between men and women has been largely um, eradicated, socially speaking. I see. So when he talks about economic sex, he's referring to this kind of reduction of, of sex to this kind of uh, industrial capitalist interchangeability. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we could we could put it like this. I mean, it's one of his kind of most um, well-researched books actually it's one of his longest books and it's kind of interesting that it got kind of ignored and also um slammed very much so like he was accused of being kind of completely reactionary by by a lot of feminists um and, oh well and nowadays he that. would nowadays this would be anathema right i mean so basically because basically what he's saying is that we need to reaffirm gender differences biological sex differences and in the reaffirmation and reclarification of that, we will find enhanced kind of humanistic, you know, uh, experiences with each other. I th yeah, I think more. Yeah, I think more weakly put, though, we could say simply that to understand the history of sex in relation to economics is an unfinished project and that this is a contribution to that debate, I would say. Yeah. OK, well, it, 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 does, it, it is an interesting idea and it does it does make some sense because, you know, a lot of people today think that if you just liberalize sexual and gender norms that somehow this is good for this is this is humanistic that this is going to be this is nicer to people with differences this is, makes everyone feel equal this makes everyone feel you know comfortable and at home but in fact what we're watching right now is that when you liberalize sexual and gender norms and pretty much anyone can claim to be any gender and uh, you know there's 
no, there's no uh, reason to, you know, be in a committed relationship. Just be poly, be gender, be like whatever you want is all equally good. This kind of ideology, like it just does, it actually uh, makes people uh, pretty unhappy and extremely conflictual. And so it seems to never really bring the 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 satisfaction and the, and the peace and the equality and all these kind of humanistic uh you know longings that we have it seems to never really bring them so i i think people are very open to this argument nowadays that uh or at this moment i think i think illich's logic yeah. here uh could be quite uh, compelling <laughs> no I, d I don't disagree and i think it, again as part of the post-liberal discussion there is an attempt to rethink the question of family the centrality of um, you know, personal and private relations as a kind of um, foundation and, and a central social bond that has been eradicated or uh, eroded, let's say, at least. Um, and, you know, the, the difficulty, actually, the economic difficulty of people who want to start a family, you know, like it's become very, very hard if you don't have much money, if you're working all the time, you know, if you want to start a family, it's it's increasingly difficult, right? And, you know, there are lots of kind of... Um, you know, and, and the, the sort of liberal ideology that says that work, getting a job or career is more important than having a family, I think, is being questioned on a massive scale. I mean, there's always a lot of people for whom that's never the case. But I think for the PMC or the middle class, um, that kind of uh, promise of emancipation through uh, selling your labor power has um, is sort of dying an even more obvious death. Um, and yeah, and I and I think the atomization of contemporary life is yeah, it's clear that a kind of loving, committed family uh, relation, marriage and children, you know, there was there was maybe a reason why that was traditional. <laughs> like maybe human beings thought that this was, you know, a good way of organizing things like sexual desire and love and affection and support, you know. So I think there is, you know, we need to revisit these questions. Yeah, it's interesting also to think back to what you said about graceful play playfulness. That, that was mm -hmm. such a lovely phrase because it's easy to see how that connects to this as well because in, in what Illich calls the loss of gender, there men and women are kind of robbed of their traditional ancestral modes of graceful playfulness in a way. Like there is a particular tradition, a, a, a cultivated uh, long running reservoir of ideas and attitudes and behaviors that are gendered and that do give us as humans this repository of of, of scripts in a way to to engage in a kind of a, a, a serious graceful playfulness and this just makes a lot of sense actually now that I think about it because you know when everyone is supposed to be potentially any gender it kind of robs men and women of their 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 gendered ways of of engaging in graceful playfulness you know what sometimes might be called like flirting or what uh you know not necessarily even flirting but um when all of this stuff is just kind of like flattened um it actually makes it harder to move through the world in a way that is light and and fun and 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 sexy like in the in these kind of low level subtle ways that that actually give life its its pizzazz you know a lot of a lot of like I guess what I'm basically suggesting is that in in the in the loss of gender there is there's way more kind of lifestyle content lifestyle kind of uh, potential and freedom and, and and joy a lot more is being erased than is obviously sexual it's not it's not it's not clearly gendered or or sexual but it's being erased simply because a lot of that traditional reservoir of actions and attitudes and behaviors are essentially gendered so if you if you if you flatten gender then you also flatten out these various little micro ways in which men and women historically have expressed themselves and engaged in this kind of uh you know uh playfulness so that's yeah. really interesting to me yeah no absolutely and i think i think it's exactly right so all these rituals of not only of courtship but of manners and etiquette and so on which are kind of predicated right. on an assumption of of gender in illich's sense um no, I, I, I completely agree. And what we then have, and it, Illich was always talking up against um, safety in a certain way, right? Like this this uh, obsession with risk and controlling everything is the part of the bureaucratization, the technocracy and um, policing of everyday life, right? So that when you start to have societies that have very strict rules, but they're top down, they're not rules from the people or rituals. They are like, uh, you know, legislation they're bringing in about, for example, you know, if men wolf whistle, 
at a woman, then sh- they should be arrested. And we could say, like, okay, maybe it's unpleasant to be wolf whistled at, but you know, to have uh, at the moment we're we're not allowed to hug each other in this country. Like, so the prime minister gave a little talk about hugging. I mean, it's this kind of. <laughs> Uh, you know, absolutely deranged <laughs> yeah. sort of technocratic control over, um, you know, people's bodily encounter, which is always sexed, you know, it's always sexuated. And um, yeah, so in that sense, I think gen- gender, this, you know, very unpopular book <laughs> by Lich and very unknown book by Lich uh, might well be uh, very helpful for rethinking yeah. what's happening. Yeah, totally. I, I, I'm very interested in this because it all. this is also one of the reasons why the contemporary workplace is so dreadful is because mm. you're not you, – it's like I'm not even talking about like, you know, men flirting with women or anything like that. Not even saying that at all. Like I'm happily married and w- in the workplace I would never like flirt with a woman. But it's like you – as a man, you don't even want to be charming like slightly. You know what I mean? Because it, it could be interpreted as, as flirting or something like that. Um and so it's like it causes the workplace to be a particularly dreadful because no one wants to be charming to other people. And so it just <laughs> how dreadful is that? Right. Absolutely. And, you know, you've got the massive expansion. This is an institution that in Illich's sense of human resources, you know, and they like, what are they going to do if they're not going to res- be able to respond to complaints about every micro perceived aggression or, you know, like, uh, yeah, form of sexual harassment or whatever. And, you know, lots of people used to meet their spouses at work, right? That you, this used to be a place where you would encounter somebody else and you'd get together. But, you know, the I think that uh, that randomness has been replaced by the kind of total regimentation of dating and meeting, right? So if you want to meet someone, you have to use an app, you know, and I write about this in the man book, this, um, you know, the proposals to kind of blockchain consent and to to have all encounters registered. You know, this is ter- terribly frightening world in which there's never any risk. You don't just randomly meet someone in a bar or at work. Everything has to be regulated. But what that means for those places, those institutions, is then the the a kind of... Um, the person or the the sentiment who is most afraid will come to ultimately dominate the entire culture of that institution, right? So if somebody is is, you know, the person who is most most neurotic or um, anxious about any form of social interaction, their sentiment or their anxiety will start to um, be the the feeling of the institution as a whole, right? Because even other people who are being playful will be will be perceived to be breaking these these rules. Totally, totally. And this is this is why shows like Mad Men were so popular. It's because it's like anything that shows people what what li- what life might have sort of been like back in the day when men and women in the workplace actually could be a uh, sexy, you know, <laughs> like like it, it's it's I, it's I think just irresistibly attractive. It's just like I want to be uh, when I go out into the world, I want to be moving around in spaces where everyone is encouraged to be their most, you know, interesting, charming, and I don't want to say like sexy or attractive, but charming, I think is maybe just the best word that gets at that kind of non-sexual uh, quality that kind of is on a vector towards towards sexuality or towards sexual attractiveness, but not quite. Um, I, I really do think the loss in just the quality of life has is way larger than people realize simply just because of how much it 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 creates this stranglehold on all forms of kind of creative flamboyant uh charmingness uh, and, yeah, and or, or it's playfulness. crazy to think Abs- yeah. yeah yeah no absolutely it's like you know if you if you run the risk of yeah getting seriously penalized or formally reprimanded or losing your job for making a kind of gentle playful comment which is misinterpreted then nobody is going to make a gentle playful comment anymore you yeah, know, exactly. That's reality. Right. So, yeah, ex- excellent. So, all right, very, very fascinating. So we're now that's that gets us past week six with the the, the gender topic, and so in the final week of the course, week seven, um, you have us read the book ABC: The Alphabetization of the Popular Mind. So yeah, I would we, love to learn. Have we, yeah, have we not missed the um, uh, a, a medical nemesis? Oh, did I we skip one? That. Maybe I did. It sounds like I did. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we can. Why don't we make it? Why don't we make a stop there then? The medical yeah. nemesis. What is that? It's a pretty. It's a pretty badass title. So what is the medical oh, yeah. nemesis? 
So, so I mean, Illich in, in being, you know, yet more kind of completely relevant and important, and this is what Agamben says as well, actually, that Illich is like basically his time is kind of overdue uh, for, you know, reclamation and, and reinterpretation. Um, so um, Medical Nemesis subtitle, The Expropriation of Health, um, basically uh, the main concept here is this idea of iatrogenesis, which is doctor-caused harm or institutional caused harm. So med- where the medical profession itself is um, creating uh, damage to health, right? And and this obviously in the wake of the past year plus uh, is an extremely uh, relevant way of trying to think about the relationship between the state, the individual, what we mean by health, um, when we think about um, health kind of collectively or individually, whether we're talking about population and so on. Um, and basically the control of health like who and this is biopolitics really like who has the say over what the health of a population is and how it's controlled and how it's dealt with and so on and one of the things that Illich all over the place um talks about that we've forgotten in this kind of risk averse um modern industrial technological technocratic society is um death amongst other things, that we try to hygienize death. And there was a very interesting article by uh, Michelle Welbeck um, arguing against um, euthanasia <coughs> the other day in Unheard. Um, but also that we've lost a sense of the tragic um, aspect of life. You know, the fact that, that life is in a way uh, suffering to a great extent. You know, that a lot of life involves a, a whole series of, of um, painful uh feelings whether they're physical or mental or both you know and things like grief are often medicalized away or you know when we talk about the kind of mass uh medicalization of something like depression or adhd or any of these kind of um conditions and even the creation or diagnosis of these conditions is is up for discussion um so illich is basically um again you know this is a, a book from um the 70s is um you know, so 70, 76, 77, is um, already fully aware of this kind of medicalization of life, you know, the total kind of dominance of um, a particular image of health to describe um, what humanity is and how it should behave and how it should be treated. So it's a very, very um, sceptical book about modern medicine and about the modern health uh, service. Um, And it would be very, very interesting to think about this, particularly in the American context in terms of questions of health insurance and also the economic um, dimension to this and who who has protection, who doesn't. And in any case, what is that um, protection um, doing? And so um, as with all of his kind of critiques, his attacks on modernity and industrialization, there's always a kind of positive aspect, too. So in the last part of the book, he tries to talk about um, the right to health and health as a virtue. But these are not this is not health as determined by institutions, right? This is not the image of health as presented us to us, which often causes us more harm than good. Yeah, absolutely. This critique of iatrogenics is really impressive because it's way before its time. This has been absolutely borne out in the data. And a, a lot of people who are in the know on this stuff nowadays would, would, um, completely agree with this. Uh, it is in fact, actually, I mean, depending on how you classify these things, um, some studies have suggested that iatrogenics or basically as Nina saying, harm that comes from doctors is actually like the third most common, uh, cause of death. The third, that's pretty insane. It's, it's, it's a massive, massive problem. It's very real. And, uh, it's very impressive that he had a sense for this in the, in the, in the 1970s when uh that's that's quite before a lot of the studies that have come out to really vindicate that so that's pretty impressive and i think very apropos yeah yeah and so okay great so yeah that was week five where you go into this um the expropriation of health so what does you know if if we had a kind of ideal um you know kind of urbanist village that was uh, ideally designed according to you know illich's uh worldview what what does the ideal kind of health system look like? Is it is it a, a kind of uh, communitarian thing, or could you speak a little bit more about what that might look like? Yeah, so I think in the um, towards the end where he presents a kind of you know positive uh, alternative, you know he 
he talks, as I said, about a, a, a different relation to anguish and to suffering and to pain, one of not, not pure acceptance, not a kind of um, absolute martyrdom to um, so on, but to, to understand that these things are part and parcel of everybody's life in that way. They're not something to be individually panicked or frightened about. And the fact is we will all die and death is a fact of life. And, you know, the, so this increasing hygienization of, of death and the elimination of death from the contemporary imaginary imaginary has very very negative effects on how we understand pain suffering tragedy but also joy right as well so it would be to bring back i suppose an understanding of the centrality of suffering to um to humanity um but he says here that health designates a process by which each person is responsible but only in part responsible to others to be responsible may mean two things a man is responsible for what he has done and responsible to another person or group only when he feels subjectively responsible or answerable to another person will the consequence of his failure be not criticism, censure or punishment, but regret, remorse and true repentance. The consequent states of grief and distress are marks of recovery and healing and are phenomenologically something entirely different from guilt feelings. Health is a task and as such is not comparable to the physiological balance of beasts uh, and so on. I mean, it's a very kind of, um, I don't know, like different way of thinking and and I think especially like the something like the pandemic is going to pose a kind of critical challenge to what Illich is saying health is because I think we're now so contemporarily conditioned to thinking about health as a kind of public safety health measure and things like vaccines and then all of the aspects of control that come along and the technocracy that come come along um with that um you know he is going to present a challenge to this Right. And it may it may look like Illich is proposing something um, rather, um, rather cruel, you know, to suggest that man must kind of live um, fragilely and in relation to this experience of pain. And it, I think it relates to what Agamben was saying over the past year. I think Agamben is very Illichian or vice versa. And I think the response to Agamben was gen largely extremely negative from the left. People thought that Agamben criticizing the pandemic control measures and criticizing, for example, the lack of the uh, the Pope going to sit with dying people and the fact that the church is closed and so on was a kind of spiritual failure on the part of um, these institutions, right, according to Agamben. But the, the kind of initial response, um, if your only criterion for anything is people must be protected at all costs, then Agamben and Illich start to look like very dangerous thinkers as if they're proposing something, you know, purely um, almost evil, I suppose, from our contemporary perspective. And I think this, so it will be fascinating, I think, to understand why he's saying what he's saying here. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I mean, it's just fascinating how this Catholic priest whose heyday was in the 70s is just uh, so on point for so many different themes that are super relevant today, not just one, not just two, but like three separate distinct uh, themes that are hugely relevant right now. So yeah, it's, it's really quite impressive. I think I, so I understand what you mean when you said uh, the, that Agamben said that uh, the, the time of village's hour has come. Uh, it definitely mm. sounds right. So in the final week, week seven, we go into this book, ABC, the alphabetization of the popular mind. And so this is kind of his take on on issues of literacy and but also kind of uh, information systems more broadly so uh, this seems to kind of really bring us up to perhaps yet another massive theme of the, of the current moment which is you know uh, the information revolution and its and its effects on our uh you know psychology and 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 relationships so what's what what do you see as most interesting in this book or, or what's really at stake in this book in in your view yeah, I mean, I think, as you say, it's to do with um, systematization, you know, and Illich kind of is always talking about institutions, but then he really is talking about systems, you know, and the way in which systems then become dominant and start to kind of eliminate all these other aspects of um, human life. So, and this is co-written with Barry Sanders, so it's a joint authored um, text, just to note that. But it's to talk about the, um, yeah, the, the effect, if you like, the historical effect of literacy as such basically, as a form of technology, right, as a kind of development within human um, civilization, um, and the way in which that then 
um, has a kind of impact on, I suppose, how we think and how we organize in general, right? So it's like, how does literacy and alphabetization and print and all of these kind of um, d historical developments, which we, which we of course, um, accept almost um, non-dialectically as positives, right? You know, the, the, of course, we think the mass literacy is a, uh, a net good. If you think about Cuba's mass literacy project or in the 20th century, you had huge socialist projects to kind of, um, you know, teach literacy to the uh, to the masses and so on. Um, so but it's a kind of attempt to kind of go back before that moment, if you like, and to to trace the um, yeah, the origin of the text, as opposed, and I suppose, and and as letters, as individual te technological devices, I suppose. You know, like one of the first things you learn at school is your alphabet, right? If you haven't already learnt it before you went to school, you know, and it, it, the, the, you know, like M Marshall McLuhan and various of these other thinkers, there's a way in which Illich wants to get behind the progress or the, the technology itself and to, to think about what it's also uh, lost and destroyed in that kind of production. Um, yeah, so I, I think, and again, it's it's not one of his more popular books, um, but again, I think it's like, um, you know, it's it's a kind of interesting addendum, basically, to thinking about technology and language as a technology uh, or language as a virus as William Burroughs might say, you know, and, and you know, we're surrounded by uh, ideologies constantly or particular ideologies like Althusser says ideology is eternal, like we can't ever really get outside of ideology. Um, and some some languages, I mean, Anglo-American or whatever we want to say, are more powerful than others. There's something like incredibly hegemonic about, you know, American English you could say, you know, everyone is infected by it <laughs> one way or another. Right. You know, it's also interesting to think about the whole kind of woke philosophy that's now increasingly ascendant or arguably dominant at this point is that it really is this kind of relatively simple system of words that you're supposed to say at certain times and places. And it, it, you can actually really reduce it to a relatively basic set of, of linguistic uh, parameters, essentially. It's like this kind of highly defined language game where anyone can learn it. It's, it's really pretty simple. And uh, there, there's some really basic heuristics. And so, and, and people do nowadays think of this as, as education, you know, and you hear the people say this, right? It's like, you need to get educated about racism or like, you need to get, you know, it's not my job to educate you. And so it's like, there's like this system, there's this basic kind of linguistic system that is taken to be uh, correct and, and good and, and kind of morally normative. And it's also conflated with, with essentially education. It's like the, you, you need to learn this, uh, you need to learn this truth of, of the world. Uh, and yet it's actually really just this like basic linguistic system. And so it's very fascinating to see how, you know, what someone like Marcuse might have called, you know, the, the, the kind of administration of, of society has really, really truly kind of made its way into even contemporary institutionalized kind of like leftist uh, thinking. And it just kind of, to me, this kind of resonates or rhymes a little bit with what uh, we're talking about with Illich, because it it basically is the application of a kind of administrative capitalist logic to words as uh, somehow being able, as a model for what education means. And I think anyone with two cents kind of can take a step back and see that that's kind of insane. Yeah, I, I mean, but it's 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 very important. Therefore, we understand how this happens. You know how these right. languages are the yeah. And, and no, I mean, I completely agree. And and you know, it becomes like you say a lang language game, even a quite simple language game um, that involves a series of tricks. It's like if someone says one thing, you know what the response should be. There's a series of mantras. There's always a series of like repeated phrases. You know, it's a kind of um, yeah, an assumed set of uh, <coughs> slogans or prescriptions um, that have this. Yeah, linguistic and increasingly viral <laughs> character, um, you know, which then mitigate against things like nuance, complexity, disagreement and history and, and many other things. Um, so, yeah, so I think it may be kind of um, a slightly oblique way into the the question that you're you're raising to finish with Illich here. But I think um, on the other hand, it might it might shed some light on how these forms of um, linguistic dominance or hegemony are 
possible. Right. Yeah, fascinating. So yeah, I, I really look forward to learning more about how that works according to Illich, because again, it just it's so, it's so relevant for for the moment. So that's basically a kind of little whirlwind tour through some of the main themes. Uh, this is this is getting me super pumped on on the course, which by the way, folks will be starting in July in, in mid mid July. Uh, Nina will be doing a an extensive eight week course all about these themes. So uh, you can. Just to remind you, you can find more information about that at illichcourse.com. That's I-L-L-I-C-H course.com. And uh, we actually made a beautiful 20-page syllabus that goes into all of the readings that we discussed today and kind of gives you a logical sequence for anyone out there who wants to study Illich on their own. Maybe you don't need a full course. You can go and grab the syllabus that we made just as a you know public good, basically. Go ahead and download that at illichcourse.com and uh yeah you can get started on the on the readings all by yourself whether you want to join the course or not so i should also say that uh nina has a book coming out which i believe you can uh pre-order at at this very moment uh it's called what do men want it's out with uh penguin very soon and i think you can go ahead and pre-order that wherever you like to pre-order your books like amazon or bookshop or whatever and so i'm excited to to get my hands on that and and read it nina are you excited about the the book launch Yes, um, <laughs> I'll be very relieved when it's uh, finally out um, and I'm looking forward to the, I don't know, either inevitably being ignored or attacked or both. Yeah, right. Well, uh, you know, no one ever said it'd be easy <laughs> to, uh, you know, write write books nowadays. I mean, that's what I always say to people. Like people, people always have these, like people are always complaining like, oh, if I write a book, it's, I'm going to get canceled because my ideas are too edgy or people are going to ignore me because my ideas are too edgy. It's just like, who cares? <laughs> it's oh, it's never been easy. Like it, no, no one ever I, promised you, a ro you know, no one, no one ever promised you a rose garden. It's like if you, in any day and age, really, if you want to write books about really important, meaningful things and you want to truly articulate a kind of independent judgment, uh, you're always going to be oscillating between the possibility of being ignored or being hated. It's like that's kind of that's kind of just the fate of of true writers, isn't it? No, I, I mean, I completely agree. And I, you know, Illich uh, himself is a good example. You know, I mean, he gets kind of like seriously attacked for the gender book at a certain point, you know, even though he's sort of also very popular at the moment. And yeah, I mean, I think the vicissitudes of a of a life, you know, are, yeah, an engaged life are, are like this for everybody. And yeah, I mean, I wonder if some of these sort of tactics might be kind of wearing thin or running out. I mean, there's been quite a lot of discussion about the publishing industry in recent weeks, about the, the, you know, the problem, let's say, of the dominance of this, um, you know, ideology. Um, because you, do you really want to put out 200 books that say the same thing in the same language? I mean, this is not a, a, a sterlingly fascinating intellectual culture. This is a, a culture in absolute stasis, right? What you want is interesting, well-researched books that tell you something you don't know, that provoke thought and stimulate discussion. And you know, <laughs> Nina, are you are you referring to this? Are you referring to this article that I think was being shared around recently about the 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 publishing industry's numbers? Like, is are we thinking of the same piece? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think so. There was a Douglas Murray piece, I think, in Unheard, but I, but it's a, it's a general problem. I mean, I think anybody who's thinking about yeah. publishing in in you know, and and there's obviously been these um, blow ups around Jordan publishing Jordan Peterson and uh, various other authors have been attacked, and you know, if you write about um, I don't know, empire, if you write about um, sex and gender, if you write about lots of different things, then um, there there is a kind of, yeah, you, you are going to get preemptively attacked often. And a lot of writers have been. Yeah, I was I saw this article recently, which was pretty interesting, just citing some basic numbers from the book in publishing industry. And uh, it's really pretty dire, like people are not buying books, and it, it, at least not at least not new books. And if, if you actually look at uh, at the numbers, it's like kind of, it's, it's kind of striking. It's like it, basically the only books that really sell big numbers that are profitable for the big publishers are the kind of ma super famous people who they pump really hard, you know? So it's like, you know, if like Lena Dunham wants to write a book or like Kanye West wants to write a book. Yeah, sure. Okay. Like uh, the big, you know, the big four publishing houses will publish that book and it will be profitable and like a fairly large number of people will will buy and read that book but for almost all other books it's like the the, the numbers are, are are not looking very promising and then you look at like weird people on the internet who are like you know uh self-publishing all kinds of chaotic things whether it's like bronze age pervert or like uh whoever it might be 
And, um, you know, they might not be doing huge numbers, but they're, but because they have complete control over it, they're doing pretty good. They're doing pretty impressive numbers and it's all the money goes to them and all of the, the readership kind of is organized around them, them personally. Um, so, so it's very, very interesting, uh, how, yeah. how I think the publishing industry's dynamics are changing. Absolutely. And I have total respect for people who um, run independent publishers or publish independently. Like, you know, one of my best friends is Lewis Parker, who runs Morbid Books, you know, who puts out things that wouldn't be published by other people or writers who wouldn't be published by the people. And, you know, it's extremely difficult to run a very small independent publisher. But the rewards for being able to publish who you want and to for them to say what they want, you know, are um, immeasurable. Like, I think the to to get away from the self censorship, this you know the censorship, the fear or the threat of being cancelled, is just um, you know priceless, really. So I think we'll see more and more people moving towards that model. Yeah, but it's really cool. Also, people like you who have managed to you know always say what you think and be quite provocative and even get in a little bit of heat here and there, but you've still managed to you know maintain your perch in uh you know in, in in the in the prestige end of things and so you know i think it's good i think it's good i think it's good to have i think it's good to have both and i'm sure i'm sure your book will do quite well because you know you've uh you, you've built you've built quite a reputation for yourself so i think if you can if you can be provocative and get a little bit of heat on the various things that you think and say without being so badly canceled that you're kind of uh you know blacklisted i think you're in an excellent position to um you know uh to still write books within the prestige circuits and you know without selling out and and hopefully with um still having a lot of impact even even within these kind of dying uh older institutional um uh publishing mechanisms I, in a way like they need you they need people like you more than than you need them in a way because you, you could do your own thing and probably succeed quite well um but it's it's good it's good to see that the prestige institutions can still um, hold on to people like you at least a little bit at the margins. It's, it'll be cur it'll be it'll be interesting to see like how long that lasts. Yeah, definitely, it will be interesting. Um, I you know I I think it's kind of um, more volatile than than yeah might be obvious um, to people on the outside. I think um, and yeah, I mean I hope I sell at least some books because I have absolutely no money. So. <laughs> It'll be great. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to be doom saying your book. I'm sure it's going to do No, no. I mean, like, I, I, I don't need much, honestly. But, you know, something more than the absolutely no money I have at the moment. And I, I didn't even qualify for any a government COVID grant because I earned so little. I made a loss last year. So they can't give me a percentage of a loss. So... <laughs> Wow. Okay. So you're, you're, you're the, you're the true, uh, starving philosopher. Well, I'm sure yeah. the book is going to do, uh, fantastically. Uh, I'll put a, I'll put a link in the show. I'll put a link in the notes. So anyone watching this on YouTube or listening on the podcast can go and uh, pre-order Nina's book. And, uh, yeah, of course, be on the lookout for the Illich course, which, uh, at the time that you're watching or listening to this, uh, the Illich course is up at illichcourse.com. And, uh, yeah, if you want to do an intensive eight week, uh, seminar with Nina. It's going to be fantastic. Nina and I have done courses in the past. She's she she uh, co-taught the Bataille course with me when we did that last time, and uh, people really loved it. So I highly recommend it. And Nina, hopefully that'll be another th th that'll be another thing that will pull you out of your 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 uh, <laughs> philosopher's poverty. And yeah. hopefully the course will do really well. I'm excited for it. <laughs> it's all good. All right, Nina, thank you so much for joining me. Always a pleasure to have you on the podcast. And this is fantastic. This is a, a real uh, tour de force through the, the key ideas of Ivan Illich. And I think a lot of people are going to enjoy it. So thank you very much for, your, for being here. I appreciate you. Great. No worries.